So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, um, before we get started, sorry, let's, we talked about amending the agenda, um, under maybe under new business. Um, we talked in the board of health about, uh, adding an agenda item to, uh, consider the topic of our hybrid model, future meetings and in-person meetings. Um, so if I could just, somebody could motion to amend the agenda to that effect. So moved. Second. Okay, um, moved and seconded. Any discussion on that? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So we'll put that under new business then. Um, okay, then let's get to body camera funding. Thank Who's got this Olson. one? Um, so just, uh, I'll start off right now and then I'm gonna ask Mark Gassaway, our finance director to provide an overview, but this is uh, regarding ongoing funding for body cameras for our sheriff's office. And the council's had um, previous discussions on this item and wanting to go out for a vote on November's ballot uh, to see if the community members are willing to um, pay for the body cameras. There are two options for the council to consider. One is the public safety sales tax, and the second is the juvenile detention facilities and jail sales tax. Um, some of the main differences, and Mark will go in a little bit more detail, the public safety sales tax does have some somewhat of complicated um, formulas and how the money is distributed to the county as well as local other local jurisdictions. The juvenile detention facilities and jail sales tax would be a full amount that would come to the county. And that one specifically goes towards the operation and facilities of our jail and juvenile. And so what that would do is repurpose that general fund that is currently funding those two areas um, to support the body camera proposal. We do have two draft resolutions for the council for your discussion today um, and staff reports. And so at this time, I would ask Mark Gassaway to just provide a little bit more detail of the two different taxes. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, I'm going to go through this um, pretty quickly. Most of it is, is a review uh, for you, um, but I wanted just to have it fresh in your minds as you're considering the two options. So if I could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so first we're just gonna review the public safety sales tax. Uh, next slide, please. So the public safety sales tax uh, must be implemented by a vote uh, and it must be done, the vote must be done during either a general or a primary election. So the only option that we have at, at this point would be the uh, general election in November. Uh, counties may impose up to three tenths of 1% uh, for each, Tenth, the, uh, the countywide collection we would be approximately six million. Uh, each tenth, uh, regardless of whether it's one tenth or three tenths, is split between cities, the uh, cities and the county, with sixty percent going to the county, forty percent to the cities, and then within the cities, it would be distributed based on the population of those cities. If the full three tenths are Im implemented uh, by the county. Uh, you cannot exceed three tenths, so the cities would not be able to implement it. Next slide, please. So as an example, if the county implemented one tenth, the county would receive about $3.6 million and the cities would receive $2.4 million. And then um, for each tenth, you would just multiply it by, by two or three, depending on which uh, decision the council makes. Um, next slide, please. In a second scenario, the cities are also able to implement this tax. Uh, they would have to, they can only implement at a maximum of one tenth of 1%. And if they were to implement this, um, and there's capacity, there has to be the capacity available. So the split would be 85% would be retained by the city, 15% would be um, would go to the county. And again, there has to be capacity. So if the full three tenths has been implemented, the cities cannot implement. Um, so it would have to be less than that amount available. So the next slide, please. So 
in a situation where the county has implemented one tenth and there's capacity available, the city may also implement a tenth uh, up to one tenth. And it's an additive formula. So if the county were to go for first, the, the county would receive as the split shows uh, $3.6 million. And then only, uh, if a city, and this example is uh, if, if a city with $3 million in sales tax were to implement, uh, the county would receive 15% uh, of that or $450,000. And, and again, it's additive. And the second tax would only be, um, would only be applicable to the amount collected within the uh, incorporated areas. Mark, Mark, yep. can I can I ask a question here real quick? So yes. in this particular scenario, we're really in terms of these numbers. This is really the city of Vancouver. And if the city of Ridgefield or Camas implemented this, these numbers wouldn't be the same, would they? Because Cor they're correct. Tax. Yeah. Okay. Correct. I just wanted the, to clarify that. Correct. Uh, the city in this case um, has a. Uh, sales tax receipt of about 3 million and Vancouver is the only one that's close to that amount. So you're correct. Okay. However, to your point, uh, Councillor Olson, uh, the city of Richfield or battleground or Camas or Rishugo could independently implement this. So they would have to go to vote just like any other city, but they could do it independently if that was their choice. So. Right. And then that would still be a 1585 correct. split, but, yeah. but a much lower number. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next slide, please. And then there is a, the the possibility, a scenario four, um, where there's a simultaneous implementation, and in that case, the amount within the city is split, or within the incorporated area, whichever incorporated area that would be, is split 85-15, and then the amount outside of that would be split 60-40. Um, and as the example shows on the next slide, uh, the to uh, this is an example where a city like the city of Vancouver would implement simultaneously with the county, and that portion, about three million, would be split um, 85-15, and the non-city portion or the non-incorporated portion, about three million, would be split 60-40. So this is kind of the, the scenarios we, we've reviewed with uh, the public safety sales tax. I wanna make sure if you have any other questions on this particular sales tax. Okay. Questions? Okay. Nope. Go okay. ahead, Marcus, I'm ready. Yeah, let's go on to the next one real quickly. Next slide. So the other sales tax is the juvenile detention facility sales tax. And again, this is um, a countywide sales tax that only counties can implement. There's no option for the cities to implement the sales tax. Therefore, it's not shared with the cities. Uh, also, uh, this sales tax um, is used, a, a, a certain ratio of this has to be used uh, specifically for juvenile detention facilities or jail facilities. Um, and, and here's the summary. Implemented by vote of the people, um, may be imposed by counties with less than 1 million. Um, clearly, we, our population is under 1 million. Uh, so we have the ability to, to, we, the county, Clark County has the ability to implement the sales tax. Um, the collections would be about 6 million and there's no sharing requirement, as I mentioned. So if you go to the next and I believe the last slide. And if I could so, just do a quick clarification as well on the imposed by counties, what that means is the county has the ability to put this out to the voters, not actually make a unilateral decision for um, imposing this. It's for, for counties with populations more than a million, they don't have this as an option to send to their voters. Correct. It must, it, it must be implemented by vote and sent to voters, correct. Um, and then the last slide, and, and again, just to follow up with the other examples, collections would be on one tenth would be about 6 million and the county would retain all of that. Um, and there is a provision that requires uh, a certain uh, ratio to be used specifically for uh, jails or juvenile detention facilities. Uh, the county already spends 
significantly more than this on our operations. So um, again, there is no language um, that does prohibits uh, supplanting. So we would be able to use this. And as um, Kathleen mentioned, we would be able to free up other general fund revenue to support the body cam program. So that as as the intent of the council is. So, so that's the last slide that I have. It summarizes the two. If you have any questions, or I I can make um, anything you'd like me to clarify. I I have a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is with regard to the juvenile detention facilities and jails uh, sales tax. Do you see any potential issue lying ahead whereby the full 6 million could not uh, be repurposed uh, uh, through the general fund for body cams? No, no, we, like I said, we spend significantly more than this already in our, um, with our uh, two facilities. And this would be, as the sales tax um, indicates, would be used for those purposes, which would free up the, and as you know, there are many sources of revenue going into the general fund, primarily property tax and sales tax, which can be used for anything. So we would be able to use those funds for um, the body camp program. So there, there would be no um, limitations on whatever we received, so. Mm -hmm. Could you give just a slight overview on how that 6 million could be uh, used from the general fund for body cams. And I presume by that we mean body cams and potentially dash cams front and rear, because all of that sure. might be in the, the purchase uh, eyes of the sheriff's office. I, I don't know. Sure. Currently, uh, we haven't um, designated any specific funding for the upfront purchase, so this could be used for the purchase, as well as the main um, objective is to have ongoing support, right? We, we have to support this program um, for the length of the program, which at this point, I don't, I don't see it terminating any time. So uh, we've received preliminary estimates at this point from the sheriff, from the public um, uh, prosecuting attorney, excuse me, from, um, you know, various um, parts, components of law and justice of what this will cost. And right now, the initial um, estimates are upwards of $2 million a year. We don't know for sure. We haven't uh, have a, a refined um, quote yet because we we just don't, um, we, we haven't gotten to that point. So all of that is um, being formulated, but we do know that the ongoing cost currently would be around $2 million. So. And, and it could, I'm sorry, uh, one, one, one follow yeah, up, if I may. Uh, could um, there be set aside in the general fund um, funds that would be untouched except for a replacement fund of the technology? Yes, mm -hmm. yes that's a good point, uh, Counselor. Uh, for most of our technology programs, <laughs> we have a um, equipment replacement fund, and certainly that would be a need in this case. Uh, this, I'm sure the technology, like any any um, computer type technology would need to be refreshed every three to five years. A and so that would be something that we would be, it would be very prudent to have that set up from the beginning. Even if we were to receive grants for the initial purchase, which which is likely there are a lot of grants available, uh, the uh, renewal and replacement of that would be the responsibility of the county, so. And Councillor, this is Kathleen, just to expand a little bit on your question as well. The ongoing costs that were submitted by the Sheriff's Office and the uh, Prosecuting Attorney's Office and others is really mostly comprised of staff. So additional staff to, for public disclosure requests. Um, so that is the bulk or the majority of there was a portion set aside for the ongoing replacement and maintenance of it. But um, the majority of that request was for FTE. Other questions for Mark? 
You know, and I'm, I'm not sure this is so much of a question, but um, Mark, if you want to comment, certainly. I, I want to make, just put it on the record. We've had one-on-ones and dug into the details of both of these possibilities. Uh, and some of the detail has changed over time as uh, further research and digging deeper, peeling back the onion, as it were on the, some of the details of each of these funding models. Uh, so this has been an ongoing process until we got to today. Uh, and and we did have some uh, issues on the narrative, if you will, depending on which way we go, on which resolution to uh, pursue. Uh, so I want to make it clear that, you know, we need body cameras and dash cams. I think everyone, I haven't heard anyone say we don't. I mean, this is uh, an, an imperative in today's climate and and we're really behind the time most jurisdictions around the country have adopted this, these programs a decade or more uh, ago. So we need to do this. Our, our budget is enormously tight. And uh, this is one way to facilitate the purchase and sustainment of this program that each chief wants and the sheriff wants. And I think we want. Um, so. The narrative needs to be out there that, hey, I know the title, juvenile detention facilities and jail sales stack doesn't sound like anything having to do with uh, dash cams and body cams, but but the law is pretty broad in allowing us uh, to use this as a funding tool. And we we do in fact have on our on our plate coming soon, uh, the remodel and improvement of our jail. Uh, so that's going to come up. All of this will go to the public for vote. And, and that's the right way to do it when it comes to increasing uh, taxes. Uh, it is a de minimis amount. And overall, I don't support raising taxes generally, unless it is uh, put before uh, the people for vote. Uh, so I really I, I am focused on the juvenile detention facilities and jail sales tax option. And, and I just wanted to make it clear that despite the title uh, of the of what the resolution may be and, and what uh, this uh, authority is, uh, we really need to um, put it to the people to su help support funding and the sustainment particularly uh, of this program. If you want to come in further on that, Mark, that that's fine. I know that we, uh, you know, we had a lot of questions about this over the past couple of weeks. Uh, no, no, Councilor, I think I think your, um, you know, your your summation there is is spot on. So, so Mark, I have a quick question for you. Um, yes, and Council Lentz, I'm sure you've got some questions. So, um, with regard to if we were to consider the um, the public safety sales tax portion where there would be a split with the cities. Is that, uh, are they also um, bound by the public safety part of that? So that would go to their public safety or, or that's not just yes. a free check for them to do whatever they want or is there, a, is there a, uh, some strings attached to that for the cities? Yes, yes there is. Um, they are also bound by the RCWs. The public safety sales tax um, is very broad though. They, they, uh, Consider public safety, both law enforcement and uh, uh, fire, uh, fire um, enforcement. I don't know what you call it, right? Um, for a city of Vancouver that has a fire department, they could use it for that. They can use it for uh, first responders, EMS. Um, it, it is very broad in the terms of what it can be used for. Body cams would be one option because it's law enforcement. So, but yes, to answer your question, cities would have to follow the same um, uh, requirements that the RCWs have as the county. Okay. And then I guess just sort of to um, kind of bring this full circle with regard to the public safety sales tax or the, the juvenile um, detention facility sales tax. I mean, the purpose of this conversation is to find funding, certainly first and foremost for the body camera program. I think that's how it got started. One thought I have in terms of trying to get a ballot measure passed is, you know, as a voter looking at what's on the ballot, why would I vote yes to increase my own taxes? And if there's a specific um, 
purpose for that tax that's clearly stated to me, I might be more in favor of voting yes for that. Additionally, I think if we were to consider the public safety sales tax, and there is this split with the cities, the cities also get to benefit from this sales tax, whether it's 0.01 or 0.02, um, they can also have some revenue. I'm thinking specifically of the smaller cities who probably can really benefit from some additional funding for public safety. Um, in addition to that, we could get them on board to help um, lobby, I guess, or campaign um, so we could get the whole community behind passing this ballot measure for public safety and specifically body cameras. So I think there's positives for both options. Um, you know, banking the whole six million for the counties one, I think we'd, we'd have a better shot at um, getting the cities on board and finding a way for everybody to support this program so that they've got some extra funding as well for their public safety um, organizations. Um, but either way, I think the first, the main thing we have to consider is how we get this ballot measure passed so that we can fund body cameras um, for our sheriff's office. Um, Councillor Lance, did you have any other follow-up questions? And we can keep the conversation. You know, I don't really have any additional uh, questions for Mark on this. Um, but I, I, as far as just following some of the conversation, I agree that we um, we do need to find a way to fund these, and that has been the conversation to date. Uh, in all the conversations we've had, around two million was the the nut we were talking about. And while we know those those funds will go up every year. Uh, very likely, um, sales tax tends to go up as well. Uh, I struggle with the idea of asking the public for more money than we have expressed that we need. So, uh, while we know that our budgets are tight, um, I, I feel like, uh, the argument could be made that it's rather disingenuous to, uh, ask for money for one thing, then put it into another and use it to shore up. If what we're talking about, if the problem we're trying to solve is how do we fund body and dash cameras, then we should try to solve that problem. And we've already expressed as a council that there's majority will to take this to the voters. So I believe that's the question we should ask the voters. And there is a, a, a measure that can help us do that. And at the same time, to follow uh, what Councillor Olson was saying, um, could potentially help other jurisdictions within the county fund their public safety uh, as well. So um, I think that uh, is both more direct uh, and less complicated than pursuing the juvenile jails tax uh, and also um, doesn't require having to message that we're asking you for this, but we're going to use it for that. And uh, I think that generally, um, we should ask for what we think we're going to spend, not for more. And I think that this is a county that supports that sort of thing as well. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, yeah, if I may. So, sure. uh, I mean, this is our first conversation as a council. Obviously, we had one on ones or maybe two on ones uh, for some of us. So, uh, we have not had any conversations with any of the cities. And so certainly joining with them on a 60 40 split uh, would have been a lot more comfortable had we had the time uh, to really coordinate our efforts with the individual cities uh, to make sure that we had a common understanding and a common purpose. We're we don't have that luxury. We can't do it and hoping for it in the future. Um, Maybe a bridge too far. Uh, it's hard to imagine politically that any of the cities, since each of their chiefs support uh, uh, body cameras and dash cams for the county, as well as for their individual departments, uh, that they would not help support um, pursuit under either mechanism, funding mechanism. Uh, we're certainly looking at and hopeful that we'll have other possibilities, and I mentioned the jail remodel, uh, jail issues, the capital investments that we're going to have to make in that uh, we hopefully will have some other possibilities for, for revenue there. But as to uh, Council Lentz's uh, point, I, you know, I agree in part, I mean, I, in asking for an additional tax and bringing in additional monies, I would say this, number one, you know, we do it with mental health sales tax. It is healthy. It is, it allows us to do a lot. We hope to do a lot more. Uh, and all along, we never know in 
accurately forecast exactly what all the needs will be. And that's true of this program as well. Uh, we did hear from each of the departments, you know, from the judiciary to the public uh, prosecuting office, you know, the defense bar, uh, it's really hard to predict exactly what all the uh, outlays will need to be for sustainment in the future. It will be enormous. It's not just the public records uh, request. It's the fact that every case, someone's going to have to look at body cam, and that's going to take a, a lot of time for the prosecuting attorney's office. Every case, the defense bar, each net to do due diligence, they're going to have to review uh, uh, body cam footage. Uh, in every case that goes to trial, there's going to be issues for the trial judge. He's going to have to go into chambers or take up time in open court uh, to review body cam uh, footage. There are enormous costs out there. Uh, and then the other point I want to make is we do have a jail remodel and there would be no binding us if, if we spent two million on the body cams and, and personnel and public records and all, all the other ancillary costs uh, that are, are attributed to body cams and dash cams, and we had some money left over, beyond that, it will be no doubt used on detention facilities, either uh, juvenile facilities or the adult facilities. Uh, so it's not gonna be a misuse or some kind of windfall uh, for the county. Uh, should this pass? And again, we're not dictating it. We're not simply putting it in place. We're putting it to the voters to say, do you want to invest a little bit more uh, in this area? So anyway, I want to make those comments. I'm not sure where we're heading. I mean, I, I support the juvenile detention facilities and sales tax. So um, because we know what we want to do with it and we know we need it. Uh, and I'm hopeful to put it forward. Uh, and, and we have a very short timeline once again. Um, if, you know, I hope we're not gonna have a 2-2 vote. And so I guess the point I'm making is maybe we need to uh, put the vote over depending on where we're at uh, until the chair is back so we have a full council. Um, I'll only comment on a couple things. Um... I don't think we need to coordinate right now with the cities. Um, I'm, I'm sure that if, if they know this is on the ballot, that between now and, and November, and they'll be able to put together a campaign and tell their voters and their jurisdictions how they would spend this money to, in, to enhance their public safety programs. I do have a serious concern about asking for juvenile detention facilities and sales tax when our purpose is body cameras. Um, that's going to be a more difficult sell, I think, to the community. Um, we've been talking about body cameras, funding body cameras, and then and now to say we're going to we're going to supplant our general fund money. But I just don't think it's I don't think voters are going to connect. Um, I think if we're straightforward, um, we get the cities on board. Voters know this tax is going to fund body cameras. That's specifically what it's going to do, and we're not asking for more than we said it was going to cost. I think the one of the things we need to be most concerned about is getting it passed. Um, and so the more straightforward, the more simple, the more direct, uh, I think is a better path to, to actually having a positive campaign and getting the ballot measure passed. Uh, if I may comment, yes. I, uh, I concur with you that getting it passed is the key to all of this. If to know whether voters for sure want a body cam program supported or not. Um, however, we, we uh, fall in separate uh, ways when I, I think about uh, that no city that I'm aware of has given the county a formal request uh, for funding a body cam program of their own. And in fact, um, probably many of us have even heard to the contrary that where um, the city wanted to fund its body cam program, it has found the funds to do that. So to tax our, uh, or ask the residents if they wish to tax themselves for 40% um, of the funds to go to the cities, uh, it doesn't uh, compute for me given 
where we have not received any requests along that line from the cities. And couple that with the fact that if the county were to receive $6 million um, to, we, we've um, heard from Mark Bassaway how those funds could be used, having a small amount put aside for a replacement fund of the technology is essential so we don't run into a crisis down the road when there are not ARPA funds available to refresh the technology as will be needed. That's the nature of technology and the ongoing support for the people who man this program um, is, is not going to uh, shrink in all likelihood because the open records requests will continue and that needs to be funded from the monies that the county would bring in for the county. So it's really for those reasons that I too would um, think that the, the better alternative to put forward to the voters would be the juvenile detention facilities and uh, jail sales tax. Um, and uh, we would then see what they say, but we will have an educational process for sure so that in either case, whichever sales tax were proposed, that the, the, the county residents understand real clearly what they're voting for. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say that if we want the voters to understand clearly what they're voting for, we should probably be clear from the beginning. And uh, it's it's striking to me that For a council majority that claims not to support increases in taxes, uh, we are trying to ask for more money than we need. And I, I, I mm -mm. that nope. gives me pause. Well, actually, it's quite a bit more. Six million is quite a bit more than is needed to fund this program. Uh, we've gotten the numbers, the preliminary estimates from all of the elements that Councillor Medvedji was talking about. We know that around 2 million, perhaps a little bit more, but around 2 million is what we're looking at. And even at 60% of the 1 tenth of 1%, we are looking at more than $3 million. So even at that 60% and then the city's also having the ability to add additional funding to their public safety programs, we have more than enough to make sure that our bases are covered and that we can adequately fund this program. I, I struggle to understand why that straightforward and direct approach is not one that this council would support. And I would hope that reason would prevail and that we would be direct in our ask and we would ask for what we need. Okay, so if I, I really want to understand Temple, what, what your position is, are you against either resolution then? Uh, Cause we can't Not at all. I mean, we Not can all, only Counselor. pick a specific the public safety thing. tax gives us what we need. And that's what we should ask for. I think that the sleight of hand of asking for a juvenile jail tax in order to backfill and then fund a different program. Not only is that just. Complicated unnecessarily complicated, but it's not what we need. If we want to ask the voters to fund a program for body cameras and dash cams, let's ask them for that. And we have the tool to do that. If okay. we want to well, ask them in the future, uh, let me finish. If we want to ask them, let me finish. Let me finish. Counselor, counselor, let me finish. Yeah, let well, me finish. I hadn't counselor. Finished. Counselor, please, I'm speaking. Counselor, ahead. let me finish. Thank you. So Go the ahead. point that you were making, the point that you were making earlier about a future project for jail renovation and future projects that we might need the money for, we don't have anything right now saying this is how much that will cost and this is what we need. So asking for future needs that may come up that we know are coming, but that we don't have numbers for. Let's go to the voters to ask for those funds when we know what they are and when we have a project. At this moment, there is a tool that we can ask the voters to approve to pay for the program that we want to put in place. I don't understand why this conversation is about anything else. Councilor Medvedi. 
you're, you're on mute. I'm sorry. I, I understand your what your position is now. You are favoring the first sales tax, and, and that's certainly great. Uh, but your argument really as to asking for more than we really need goes to both resolutions. It's the same argument, because we can only ask for 0.01% and then in increments. So across the cities and the county, we're going to be asking for more. Uh, than we need, and we don't know what the cities are going to be paying for. So your argument is exactly the same for both. Both resolutions. Please don't put words clear. in my mouth, Councillor. I am talking now, Councillor Lentz. Thank you. Uh, Do not put both words in my resolutions mouth. are very clear uh, that exactly what we're asking for the funding uh, for body cameras and its and dash cams and there's, and sustaining them. So uh, that no one's pulling a sleight of hand. No one's. But we, we can't say, hey, we need $2 million for body cams and dash cams. That's what we're asking the, uh, the, uh, the people to vote on. The other issue is, and Mark will confirm this, these are really, really rough estimates. We don't know what we're going to take in in sales tax. We don't know what it will really bring in. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of vagueness. At, so, anyway, I... I mean, I, I think I understand now you want to go for the for the first um, option and uh, basically uh, you and Councillor Olson are really advocating for the cities uh, to get this money um, more than anything else at, at a time when we just don't know what the cities. I mean, I, there's been no conversation with any city representative from any of the jurisdictions as to whether they need the money for anything or what they would use it for. Uh, so I just want to bring those up and then reiterate, I think we need the chair uh, to have this vote, to have a full council. Thank you, Council Mitchie. Um, I'll, I'll make one more comment and then we'll move on because I can, I can clearly see where we are. Um, we're not, and I'm not advocating first and foremost for the cities. I'm advocating to try to get a solution to the voters that I believe will be the best way to get it passed, get us what we need and get the ballot measure passed. That's the purpose of, of why I'm a little bit more in favor of uh, of the public safety sales tax. I think and for all the reasons that I've stated so far. So, so we're in an impasse here on this topic today. Um, we can do one of two things. Um, Councilor or, uh, Kathleen is trying to reach chair choiring uh, to maybe set a special meeting for the topic of uh, resolving this particular conversation either this week or um, early next week, and if not, worst case scenario is it goes on our uh, Tuesday agenda and we'll um, decide then. So we'll keep everyone posted as to uh, schedule. Kathleen, do you have any input on that? No, the only thing I can say is uh, special meeting notices require 24 hour notices. So when I hear back from the chair, I'll provide some options. Um, and then just a reminder, and I know you guys have kind of talked about, you know, the timeline's a little short. The information is due to elections on Tuesday, the same day as the hearing, the next hearing. Um, so if we don't meet that deadline, it will not make it on the November ballot. But I will be in communication with you and then we will notice any special meeting per um, the regulations that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, so do we, why don't you, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with scheduling once we hear back from uh, the chair and hopefully we can get this done sooner rather than later. Okay, so equestrian follow up. Good morning. Oh, okay. Sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. Good morning. Uh, so, just by way of background, I know I've spoken with you, but just um, for members of the public. So, um, beginning really, you know, a couple of years ago, but um, this process that we're talking about started with uh, February and October of 2020. There were some county events that were put on um, to solicit feedback from the equestrian community and from neighbors that were affected by neighboring equestrian properties. And as a result of those forums, if you will, um, the um, Prior code administration director Mitch Nichols brought forward to the council um, this rural equestrian facility stakeholder group. And the purpose of the group was to try and bring together representatives of different parts of the equestrian community and some of the affected neighbors to say, 
Are there pieces of the code that don't make sense? Are there um, things that are maybe too onerous or just don't work with the equestrian community? And how also do we preserve the um, the rural way of life, both for people that own horses and the people that are neighboring and want to be able to peacefully enjoy their, their property in the rural areas? So, um, as part of the transition, I've taken over um, the rural equestrian group. We had our first meeting um, looking at the calendar on July 15th, Thursday the 15th. And um, as part of that meeting, following with what Mitch had put together, um, the first meeting was really just a non, um, non substantive, but really more of a procedural meeting to say, okay, here's the introduction of the, the stakeholder group uh, members and then orientation to the group. Here's what the current issues are, what the work plan is, what our meeting plan and timeline are. The intent um, at that time was to say we're going to have weekly meetings, keep the momentum going with the group and hopefully reach a resolution sooner rather than later because this issue has been out there for a while. And so have weekly meetings and then hopefully by the end of August, early September, have some sort of consensus to bring back forward to um, Kathleen and to the council. So, um, as you know, after um, that meeting, well, back up a little bit. So the the topics that Mitch had proposed and that I worked into the general work group is looking first at the, the definitions that we use. There's some definitions with our code that really aren't found in other county codes um, in terms of what a private equestrian facility is boarding facilities we we have language in there as far as animal boarding facilities but when you drill down into the language that applies only to um, domestic animals which really is cats and dogs and other pets it's not livestock it's explicitly not livestock so what definitions do we have there's um, some thought out there in terms of soundproofing and fire sprinklers in subsequent conversations with legal that may not apply in these situations. Um, and I would encourage the council to um, either have one on one briefings or a council time briefing with legal to talk about that. And I'll, I'll get there in a moment. Um, looking at how do we do code compliance? What are the impediments? What are the, you know, the options for incorporating um, exempt agricultural structures? How do we deal with existing barns and facilities that are out there? You know, what sort of grandfathering mechanism do we have? How do we identify and mitigate those community and neighborhood impacts? Um, and what do we do for accountability measures when violations of the rules occur? So that was really the, the overarching plan for the group. Subsequent to the first meeting, um, there has been a lot of um, email and um, other communication between members of the public and the council regarding this equestrian group. Um, I think it's fair to say that the equestrian community feels that they are um, either not being adequately represented or that they're being attacked um, in social media and that um, there are some that say the council is not in favor of horses. And I've reiterated to them that that's not the case. On the flip side, I think that there are the neighbors that are saying the council's only in favor of horses. The council had the county hasn't been hearing um, our concerns. And the concern that I have is to make sure that we have a process that um, the integrity of the process is something that all parties can trust. And I'm concerned that that's not the case right now, given the tone and tenor and quantity of the communications that I have seen. And so before moving forward with this, I went ahead and said, we're just going to pause. I'm going to bring this back to the council and say, what direction are we going to go? Um, and a few options for you. One, the council can say, yes, this is the way we want to go. These are the people that we want to have. This is the group um, and we're going to resume meetings. Another option would be to take a pause, allow you to have the opportunity to talk to legal, really see what code options are out there. Um, because when I reviewed with our um, code officer, I, I talked to Kevin Pridemore and said, how many facilities really are we talking about? In the last five years, there have been 11 total. Um, and half of those cases are closed, half of them remain open. But if we assume, you know, 30,000 horses out there, we're talking a very small fraction of the number of equestrian facilities that have been reported and are um, in process or closed as part of our code uh, program. So 
we can talk about really do we need to be making code changes at all? Is that where the council wants to go? Another option would be to split into two stakeholder groups, start the process over of soliciting um, resumes and soliciting interest statements um, so that we maybe have a neighborhood group and we have um, a equestrian group so that there's not the contention within the stakeholder groups. Um, of course, ultimately, it's up to the council what direction that you want to go, um, but those are just some ideas. So I, I put it out there to say, what what is your will in terms of moving forward with this, uh, given the communication we've received recently? Feedback for Lindsay. I have a question for Lindsay, if I may. It seems like in the emails that we've received, much of the contention, if not most of it, deals with who is serving on the committees not a specific code that is violated or a specific rule of some kind that is violated. There are general complaints about smell and whatever, but mainly who's on the committee. Is, the, is, that, is that what's happening or can you point to specific code that is concerned? So um, I think that there are there there's some understanding amongst the equestrian com community as far as soundproofing fire sprinklers that may not be accurate, and I want to make sure we get out the accurate information to the community. Um, so there are some code concerns, but I think it may be more of a clarification issue than a need to change the code. Um, but in terms of who is on the committee, I think there's there's two parts of that. One. Um, there's there's some contention in terms of the actual members of the committee, and I'm not sure the process, unfortunately, that Mitch went through to select these particular members. Um, so I don't know how they were chosen, but there, there are some that say, I don't want so and so on the committee. I think that there are others that are saying there's a disproportionate representation, or I don't really care who's on the committee, but people need to act in a cooperative and respectful manner. And these people, you know, they're saying these people are not so it's. It, it's somewhat of the people, somewhat of the group dynamics, somewhat of the behavior of the people. Sometimes it's people outside of the group and how they're influencing the group. It's a little bit of all of it. So, if I may, so I, this has been a really long and tortured process strictly because of the pandemic. I mean, what, I think we were all hopeful to have this done a year and a half ago and and then we really hit pause on the whole process you know no counselor had any role in selecting anyone for this committee and i and i like the point you made lindsay i mean you shouldn't be subjected uh to trying to uh quell a riot uh each meeting that you have and so separating the issues i mean i always saw the issues as being separated you know way back when it was well, how do we get rid of these onerous building code requirements that the uh, that no one and staff could even explain why they existed? Some of the uh, the burden of hundred thousand plus for sprinklers uh, in a, a facility that wasn't going to house any human beings, and insurance companies were probably very satisfied with we were putting those requirements on insulating stalls, curfew hours. Things that I I heard through the through some staff that were adopted from Oregon somewhere in Oregon like 15 years ago, but no one had an explanation um, for why they're there. But we heard from the equestrian community that none of them makes sense whatsoever. That they're actually unhealthy for horses, and obviously people on wells can't even support these sprinkler systems uh, to begin with. And besides the enormous Burden. So uh, the first issue was, hey, let's get rid of this nonsensical code. You know, we want people to comply with code, but we don't want code that's in place for no uh, benefit to anyone other than and and hardly anyone was complying with the code because it was so so onerous. So that's one topic. You know, the the nuisance complaints, uh, the code enforcement from manure management to dust, traffic, noise. You know, uh, uh, business running businesses in rural areas. Uh, those are really 
different issues, I think, and, and maybe it would be good to reset and restate what we should go forward with since it's literally been over a year since we started this process and maybe take it in smaller chunks. Let's um, maybe go after the code and make sure that we do. I, I, I understand it. I'm not sure we're getting mixed messages between uh, the lawyers now and and previous statements that Mitch has made uh, about what's even required by the code. So maybe we just need to clear up the code and then reach back to the community and have open houses and say, what would you like? I mean, we, we need areas to protect equestrian use. I like that comment from the equestrian community, uh, from zoning to, hey, we, we would voluntarily have a mediation group to try to mediate between neighbors, the few neighbors that are having problems uh, and the few operators that don't seem to care or manage uh, as strictly as they should. You know, that's a great initiative. Uh, so maybe we do need to separate the issues and then have more productive meetings. Um, Cause I, I don't think replicating what you went through the first meeting will, will help us very much. And social media is just really blowing all this up. Um, way out of proportion and aggravating, I think both both sides of the issue or the many sides of the issue. So my druthers would be to kind of restart, reset, let's break this down to smaller chunks. And I think the easiest, the low hanging fruit is getting rid of some code that doesn't make any sense and puts too much of a burden on the equestrian community. So just to clarify, um, within county code 4260.040, there is a soundproofing requirement for animal boarding and animal day use facilities. But when you look through the definitions, they apply only to domestic animals and explicitly not for livestock. So when I reached out to legal and I asked, you know, where I'm not sure where this originally came from, if this is within the community or if this came from staff or where. And legal said, I agree with the assessment of the soundproofing requirements. There's not any code provision that would apply, impose that requirement. Um, and as far as fire sprinklers, they're, they're required based upon size and occupancy within the, the building code, but really it only applies where there's an assembly occupancy. So it's over 12,000 square feet or an occupant load of over 300. So at that point, you're talking the major equestrian facilities that um, would house significant numbers of people of the public. Um, that's not your your you know barn that houses six horses and has you know a couple, you know a dozen people in there at one time. So um, I think there that's where I'm saying there may be some misunderstanding. I'm not sure where that came from, um, but we we may not even need to address the code if if the goal was to eliminate the soundproofing requirements and modify the fire sprinkler requirements. I think our codes already there um, from what my understanding of what the council's intent was. Yeah, so I don't have a specific recollection if that came from Mitch uh, or if it came from someone complaining about it and Mitch didn't really clarify it. Uh, so, I mean, that just kind of restates that we need to uh, reset and understand what the issues actually are and, and maybe open houses with the question community would help get a clearer um, understanding of what the code actually does require and what it doesn't. Um, so anyway. Lindsay, one of the other issues that I recall seeing and hearing in some of the communications at where there's some confusion, and I don't know if it's confusion or that a change is required, uh, was the public and private uh, entities. Um, and and how do we define what is public and what is private and what rules apply to each as far as our code and and interaction with the community? Yeah, so that actually was an idea that came from from Mitch of do we define a private facility different than a public facility? And if, would that be a possible way that we could address some of these code requirements? It's not actually currently within our code, though. Um, so that was just an idea that he had, I think, coming maybe from this idea of the soundproofing and fire sprinklers that if you had a purely private that you wouldn't need to meet these higher commercial type of building requirements that make sense when you have, you know, hundreds of people in a building. Um, but it's not within our current code. 
And so if that's something the council wanted to look at, I'm not sure what problem would we would be addressing with that, given the, the interpretation I'm hearing from legal. Um, so, again, that was an idea of something that we could do, but it's not within code. So, uh, Councilor Lentz, you're absolutely right, and that was addressed by a lot of the equestrian community. If you remember that, that many hours of testimony from the public, uh, because it's, you know, where does code enforcement even engage? And so, a lot of people were complaining that they were engaging because into private issues, um, and but the private issues were explained well. You know, I don't advertise. It's just family and friends, or I invited the scouts, or I invited this group to my private property. So there was, I, I think Mitch was right in trying to define private and public to de, to kind of differentiate where their efforts uh, would even be. Where what jurisdiction do they have? I mean, code enforcement is really challenged uh, across the board in trying to solve neighborhood squabbles that may be involving private disputes or private nuisances that can be better addressed through mediation uh, or uh, through the court system uh, versus our county code enforcement. So, you know, I agree that the def, I think he was right in trying to better get uh, at a substantive definition to know when their, their office would even be triggered uh, to get involved, um, I it was a it was a big point of discussion. So I appreciate Lindsay knowing that um, it was a, the public private was a little bit of a problem of our own creation. Uh, I think I'd be interested in something like what we've heard so far with different groups. Um, at this point, there is so much confusion and rancor around this uh, from uh, folks in the equestrian community, from folks living near it, uh, that to start with our code issues first, or perhaps lack thereof, uh, I'd be interested in um, perhaps a, an open house town hall situation where the code is presented and talked through, and we hear from members of the equestrian community about what is working, what doesn't, where, and we learn where the confusion points are so that we can then try to address them. Um, unfortunately, I think perhaps what occurred earlier is that there was a bit of inventing problems in order to solve them, and maybe we just need to hear you know, if somebody says this, this piece of code is absolutely unreasonable, but in talking through, we learn that it's actually interpretation of the code and application of it that needs to be needs to be managed. That'll be helpful for all parties. Um, and perhaps then we don't. I, I could see arguments in favor of either a town hall situation where anybody can come or we do try to find an, uh, an educated and uh, uh, informed task force of folks who do work specifically in the equine community to help us work through some of these like one of the recommendations i know we heard about this previous task force was there was no you know equine vet uh on it and so like make sure that we have people who can help us understand the full range of issues um to do a first pass at this before we bring it to a larger group i I could argue on both sides of going big first or going small and then big um especially given the issues we've had with group membership uh, concerns. So uh, I'll leave that there. I, I think um, I like I like that uh, train of thought. I, I'm a little bit concerned given the volatile nature of the communications at this point that uh, the groups would be large and involving people from every side. Therefore, I think it would be there would be benefit in starting with more focused gr groups for understanding and focus for that matter, and then moving uh, perhaps to a larger group. Um, would it be a relatively uh, simple process, Lindsay, to name the people for two smaller groups, one the neighborhood group and one 
the equestrian group? Sure, I think we can do the process similar to what we've done for, you know, soliciting interested applicants for other types of groups. Um, what I would propose is to offer to the people that are currently on the group that they could stay into these two do groups um, and then open it up for any additional people that would want to. And if we get, you know, 150 applicants, I'll come back to the council and say, uh, what sort of size do you want to choose? But whether it's 10 or 12, I, I don't really think that that's going to matter. So it would depend on what kind of response that we got um, in terms of what size we would have. It okay. sounds like on both sides, what we really are seeking is understanding. And then we move to understanding of the other side, which at that point, clearly both groups would need to be involved. Can I offer up a, um, just another thought as well, considering all the, and I, I think we're on a great track here in terms of trying to reset this conversation about what, what's accurate and what's not accurate in our code and its interpretation. Um, and, and I think this is, important for us as well in terms of the code language if we're going to consider doing something with it or not doing anything with it but it, what about um with this group that's already been organized having them just send to us their top number of concerns what they believe their concerns are with the code what they believe their their issues are with um uh, with the whole equestrian conversation we could cull through a lot of maybe some of the misunderstandings internally um and kind of develop an faq and then get back out to a group i'm just thinking we might be able to truncate some of this um in person misunderstanding stuff if we get it all in writing from them first so if we say all right what are your we've gotten these emails from these folks what, what is your major concern about the equestrian code as it's as you are as it stands today based on your understanding and your concern and maybe we can um clear some of that up just through processing through uh, their questions, just a thought. Um. Yeah, and we actually have, um, that's one of the things from the 1st meeting was, okay, where are these properties? You know, some of the that are having a lot of the complaints and some of the equestrian community saying we might be able to go out and provide assistance, you know, to these sorts of situations um, and the neighbors have significant documentation of their their complaints what i was thinking about is with these two separate groups about having an kind of an initial meeting with the group to say okay what questions do we have having the right staff in the room um and looking and kind of having a presentation to the group members to say this is what code currently requires this is how if you have a complaint we would process it these are your other options outside of you know county code enforcement um and really setting that that state to answer those questions and provide all of that information to them. But there may so be I some know. benefit as well to having to open house or town hall or some sort of modified public work session where the council can hear the information um, and then any members of the public can come and hear it as well. Um, because otherwise we end up with the game of telephone where I heard from the council this and then it goes through the neighbors. And um, so having some bigger open house type of thing, I think could be beneficial as well. Yeah, and Mitch, Mitch had that planned. Uh, I think we never got to it because of the pandemic. And I like Julie's idea right away. I mean, just to kind of get in writing top three or top four or top five, whatever they may be. Uh, so I, I'm hearing a kind of a restart because we really do need to find out what's urban legend out there and what the real issues uh, are. I, I do have a question, Lindsay. It's because that. You know, Karen Bowerman mentioned it would be good to have members of the stakeholder group from, you know, the industry, the, you know, those established equestrian facilities. Do we have any of those uh, on that committee right now? Because, because my, when we first started this, I started touring some of the equestrian facilities, and and the ones I saw were amazing. I mean, just real good stewards, real conscientious. I mean, they address every issue um, in a very positive way. Uh, so they know the best practices. I mean, they're well established. They know the best practices. They're tied into our conservation uh, district uh, and they're just, and then provide such an uh, amazing um, and it's more than recreational. Some of it's therapeutic, especially the veterans uh, facilities. I mean, they do. So I, I'm hopeful that we 
can hear from them because they're they're the best most professional at this and uh, they seem to solve problems yeah the initial group that mitch put together actually has more representatives from the equestrian community um i think in part because there's different facets of the equestrian community there are the big facilities that um, do services for veterans and um, kids with uh, disabilities and other services like that equine therapy for mental health um, and just larger commercial equestrian facilities. And then there are the smaller ones where it's, you know, somebody and their their sister and their friend's horses and there's, you know, six horses on a property or something. So trying to have representation from different facets. Um, yes, there are those representatives that are on the group. I think that there are probably others that I know have reached out to me and said, hey, I, I submitted a letter of interest, but I didn't make it on the group. I don't know what happened. So I think that there are others that would be interested in participating as well. So what I would like to do um, is to kind of regroup, put together sort of what Mitch had done um, in terms of a split group and a plan to um, you know, have some type of open house or town hall type meeting, um, whether that's the initial meeting or that's sort of what we go to, um, get their complaints and writings, open up for applications, but I will put together a, a plan and then revisit this uh, either with you in one-on-ones or a subsequent council time session. Does that sound appropriate? Sounds good to me. Yeah, I, I do like that. I want to be clear too that when we're asking for complaints, we aren't solely asking for complaints about equestrian facilities, but also complaints about county code so that for those who are trying to operate safely and productively under our code, if they have issues, we're trying to hear from them. I just, when we hear complaint uh, and given, given the, the communications we've had, this is not about the county seeking um, turn in your, your, your equestrian neighbors. This is, we want to hear what is and isn't working for all people right. in this regard. Yeah. And I think it's um, sufficient to say traffic is a problem, dust is a problem. I don't need specific car counts on a specific property. That's not going to help either. So, um, yeah, it's it's trying to get to what can the council do to address the problems. We may not be able to fix the number of cars on a particular parcel, but how can we, you know, address them globally through the code? Yeah, and I just uh, just more semantics. I wouldn't even use the word complaint. Or problems. Right, exactly. I would use the word yeah. issues, concerns, feedback, something like that, <laughs> just so we don't open up a, a line of thinking that um, we're going to regret. <laughs> okay, sounds like a good plan. Everybody on board with that? All right, perfect. Okay, um, before we move on, um, our next conversation is going to be about meeting agendas or schedules and in person, and out of person, hybrid, et cetera. Um, Kathleen, did you have some anything you needed to add to the conversation before we move on? Yes, thank you. So uh, with regards to the tax options for body cameras, there is um, an opportunity for the council to submit a press release asking for volunteers to write for and against statements. If the council chooses not to do this, I believe the auditor's office then would actually choose who they are. If the council is interested in um, soliciting the public participation on this, um, I would like to get out a press release today, and what I can do is say the council is considering these two taxes, um, and if people are interested to submit their names to us by next Monday so that we have um, that list, because if we want to move forward with people that you choose, that will have to be submitted on Tuesday as well. So I wanted to make sure nobody has an issue with that. Um, certainly, if you don't want to choose, we can have the auditor's office do it themselves. Okay. Um, thoughts from the council? I have no objection to allowing the order to handle the whole thing. In fact, some of this came directly from from the auditor, uh, as far as and anyway. I, I, I have no no real position on it. I'll go with whatever anyone wants. Other feedback? I generally think we could probably get. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Council Lance. Was that no, you? I was just. I uh, I'd be in favor of the press release going out. I think there are some community members who may be interested in serving, so a little more notice to them, to let us know that they'd be interested, even if we don't yet know the outcome. Um, I'd I'd be in favor of that. 
I, I believe that I would too, yeah. um, but I'm wondering, uh, would you solicit uh, one group that would respond to one type of sales tax and a different group of people to respond to another type of sales tax? Yes, so what we put in there is that the, the council is considering these two options. If you're interested, please identify which option you are interested in. Okay, because we, it wouldn't be helpful to have someone respond, taking a lot of time to do it, saying, well, I prefer this option, you know, because we will have gotten past that point as far as what goes in the, to the voters arena. Yes, and we can have, like I said, the deadline on Monday morning, and I just, I've been texting with the chair, and I will be working with staff to schedule a special meeting for Monday. Um, so we'll have this, these names prior to your special meeting. Okay. And then, uh, Kathleen, I just wanted to clarify one point, and that is that uh, it is just a timing issue. The, the, if the council would like to appoint for and against um, statement writers, essentially, that would need to happen by the deadline as well. So we need to select the person essentially, or the people essentially simultaneously with the, um, any action. So if we put the press release out today, then one of our potential other meeting agenda items, if we're on a meeting on Monday, we would select the for and against names at that point. Is that what I'm hearing, Taylor? I think that makes sense. Okay, and I'd be in favor of the press release too. So if we get any interest in those who would want to write a, a for or against statement. Okay, so Kathleen, we'll get the press release out today. Thank you. That's all. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to new business. Um, Kathleen, just briefly. Um, I just want to recap where we were headed for next week. We were headed, I believe, to a hybrid model of um, holding our meetings. Can you just touch base on that real quick, and then we can talk about this potential face mask question. Absolutely. So um, in prior conversations, um, it was decided that we would open up any public meetings that the public's allowed to go to with the council, um, and that they we have notice downstairs, so if they are not vaccinated, they would need to wear masks. If they are vaccinated, they don't have to wear a mask. We do have some social distancing set up in the council hearing room. With regards to staff and council, it will be up to individuals if they wanna to continue to participate through WebEx or come in and participate in person. Um, the OPMA does still provide that flexibility for the council to have this hybrid approach and allowing the community to come in, or the council could, you know, certainly determine at this time if you don't want to continue moving forward with the public coming in. So it's 1045. Do we know if the governor has started his press conference yet and if we've gotten any feedback on that? I know we start at 1030. I do not know what the topic is. I did hear it may be regarding schools, um, but I do have Johnny is actually watching you right now, so we can touch base with her and see if she's heard anything specific. Okay, well then I guess my first question um, I would pose to the council would be, given uh, our Board of Health meeting this morning, do we wanna stay on the same path we're on right now with regard to hybrid meetings? And if so, do we want to, um, add any requirement for masks for those that come in from the public. So for me, I, uh, if we stayed on the course for hybrid, I would want to see a mask requirement for the public. Um, I think that given what we've been seeing and if there's reticence to, to make a reasonable mask mandate, um, then, I would suggest postponing the move to hybrid for at least a month. We're seeing a relatively recent but large increase in uh, in cases and transmission in Clark County. So for our for the purposes of managing our meetings and our interaction and doing what we can as an agency with the ways that people come into contact with us, it seems that staying uh, remote for another month while we see where things go, could be a way also to just 
keep everybody socially distanced and uh, uh, for those who don't want to do the mask mandate, then we can avoid that as well. So my thoughts are the same as earlier. I, I think this is premature. We need to hear and digest what the governor is saying today. I mean, we can speculate. It may very well be just focused on schools. I don't know. I mean, the uh, certainly the briefing that we heard today was not positive. Um, and but if you if you are going to make move forward today, I, I would support Councillor Lynch's uh, suggestion that we just delay uh, uh, change and just keep it uh, the way we have it now. I. I don't want to put in any, make any specific changes until I've heard uh, what the governor and his uh, uh, director, uh, secretary of health, is has put out this morning. Since we Kathleen, Kathleen. I'm sorry. This is Kathleen. I was just um, forwarded. This is coming from a news station, but it is a breaking news saying Governor Inslee announces that Washington State will follow current CDC guidance and ask Washingtonians statewide, even those who are fully vaccinated, to consider wearing a mask in public indoor settings in areas of substantial or high transmission. So he is announcing the same guidance that CDC um, stated, which Dr. Malik shared this morning. So it's highly recommended. Uh, just a thought, since we are meeting on Monday anyway, uh, probably fairly briefly, would it be possible to uh, give some thought to this and uh, make our decision on Monday? Yeah, we can do that. Um, I don't see a problem with that. I, I would lend maybe, I don't know that the guidance from the governor really changes anything, except that he's encouraging and, and I think, you know, I think my my gut would be just to um, continue as we are with the status quo for at least another month and see how we're doing. Um, but I'm okay with um, if we don't have three that want to do that. That just puts this discussion off for another month rather than a, another couple of days. Uh, clarification <laughs> is the status quo referring to our prior decision to go hybrid. No, I'm sorry. Status quo is where we are right now with remote meetings. Yeah, I appreciate the clarification yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that would be my that would be my where I would lean. It's just we we stay remote. We don't go to the hybrid model. Wait another month and see where we are, and then we don't have to really engage in this mask discussion at a at a deeper level right now. And given that the mask requirement would be as Kathleen you described at the outset, where it is recommended, but optional. Yes, it is highly recommended. Mm -hmm. And something else for the council to consider, we would need to make sure our community members know if there's going to be a change. Um, so I'll, you know, whether it's Monday or today, I'll have Johnny will be drafting a press statement if we were to continue with how we're operating now so that the community is aware before Tuesday morning's meeting. That seems like a prudent thing to do. Okay, yeah, I think so. And then and then it'll give this the us chance to communicate with the community as well rather than waiting till Monday to, to either make no yeah. change or yeah. any change. So okay. Is everybody okay uh, with that for now? Yeah, so I'm not real clear. So where are we now? We're gonna delay the decision to go hybrid or yeah, we're, we're gonna just stay with okay. our our remote meeting as we're doing it currently for another month and then Okay. If we need to revisit it between now and then, we will. Yeah, I just want to make sure. So, yeah, I would support that versus mandating masks at this time. Okay. Then uh, I would entertain a motion. Um, I move to have uh, county meetings stay remote for uh, another month through the month of August, to be specific. I'll second it. Okay. Any other discussion on this topic? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. At council reports. So I I did get an email. Um, I'm so reluctant to send 
emails to everyone because some some of them are welcome and some of them aren't. Uh, I was a, a little disappointed that we kind of got behind as far as a, a pu public statement by the council uh, on the loss of our deputy. And so I had asked that we um, have a letter presented or resolution, or some public statement about the devastating news uh, about our deputy being killed in the line of duty. Uh, so Kathleen had suggested I bring it up now. Uh, I know that uh, Eileen Quaring had responded because I, I think I only copied her when I copied um, the manager on my request. Uh, so I know she supports responding publicly as a council. So I, I throw that out there. I th I would agree. I think um, and without and I think Tuesday or Tuesday meeting would be the appropriate time for that. And we could maybe put together a resolution of some kind. Does that work? That would be good. okay. Thank you, Councillor. Anything else? Uh, no, that's it. I think I had copied Lindsay on it since she sees to be a our prolific draftsman. <clears throat> um, but anyway, I'm hopeful that Kathleen can uh, move it forward. Councilor, yeah, we can get this drafted and we'll put it on Tuesday's meeting um, for your information. We'll send it to you ahead of time as well. So if you Thank have you. individual feedback, please per don't reply all. Just send individual feedback. We can incorporate it. And let's see if you could take the lead on drafting that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bowman, I think you were trying to speak, but you were on mute. Yes, thank you. I um, do have a, 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 I think it's more uh, of a query of council than it is a report, but most of the jurisdictions uh, that are affected have been in communication with the interstate bridge uh, replacement project uh, committee. And um, I discussed with the chair if um, she felt that perhaps our uh, council would uh, it would be appropriate for us to take a position and communicate that position to the uh, to the committee as well. Um, I think that would be a good thing to do, Rhett, because we are so dramatically affected by what happens with decisions on the bridge. Um, I don't know if that would be a a, a, a good agenda item for. Uh, right away, or if it would be a good agenda item at all, but I did want to bring up the topic. Yeah, I think if, um, if you and another counselor want to put it on a council time agenda at any point for discussion, I, I think that's perfectly appropriate and probably a good idea to, to the process to use to do that. So I think any council time would be um, the right way to do that. So did you want to talk about it now or do you want to wait for all five of us put it on a council time agenda? Uh, I think it should be on the agenda, yeah. yes, so that we could take some official action, yes. Okay, and if you've yeah, got... So I, I second that, and, you know, I, I think the more we talk about it and the more of a public leadership role we take on the issue as well on behalf of the county, uh, I so I would like to pursue it. Okay, and if you've got... Um... General outline or thoughts or um, specifics that you want to send out or that we can get ahead of time so we can all digest before council time. So we're all kind of talking off of the same piece of information as we start the conversation. That would be great. Sounds good. Thank okay. you. You bet. Any other counselor reports? Okay. Uh, work session requests. The first one is from community planning. This is regarding the housing option study and action plan update. The um, advisory group has been meeting since January of this year, and this would be the second update that they would be providing to the council. They would like to um, understand any key council questions, concerns, or ideas at this point in the project to bring back to the advisory group and consultant team to inform the next phase of their work. And they're looking for one hour in the middle of September. Okay. Without objection. Okay. 
Okay, then the second one is the Columbia River Gorge Commission management update. The Columbia River Gorge Commission recently updated its management plan and counties with lands in the National Scenic Area are required to amend their ordinances to be consistent with the management plan. So the, um, the desired result for this work session is to inform the council of the range of amendments to Title 40.240 and receive direction from council on a public outreach approach. They're looking um, in August for one hour. Okay, and we've got time in our August calendars. I'm sure that's their desired date. We will make sure that it, we're not scheduling you with too many in one day. Okay, okay. Um, thoughts, feedback, objection? Okay, the third one is from Public Health. This is, um, they've been working on the Clark County Code 24.17 on-site sewage system rules and regulations. They were, uh, it has not been updated since 2007. They have been working on this program for the last couple of years. Um, this will clarify several portions of the code and align Washington Administrative Code with this. So the, they were looking at 60 to 90 minutes um, as soon as the schedules allow so that they can get this solidified and moved forward. Okay, without objection? Are you good with that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let me find my agenda. Are we done? Uh, Lindsay. I have two things for you. One uh, quick and one will take a little bit more time. The first, um, as you are called, the county council is putting forward two proposed charter amendments to the county for um, the general election ballot this year. In addition to that, the Charter Review Commission is proposing seven of their own amendments that will go on um, the same November 2021 general election ballot. As part of the Charter Review Commission's work, they have been asked by neighborhood associations and other groups to come and present about their proposed charter review or their proposed charter amendments. And um, Chuck Green, who's part of the Charter Review Commission, um, aptly noted um, that there probably would be some people in the audience that will ask questions about the council's proposed charter amendments. And I think um, understandably so the, the, the public may not understand the difference between what's coming from the county council and what's coming from the Charter Review Commission on their ballot, it will appear the same. And so um, they are, the Charter Review Commission is um, suggesting that they include a couple of slides within their presentation about the council's proposed charter review or the council's proposed charter amendments um, so that the public hears about all nine as opposed to just the seven. So I, I reviewed the presentation. It's just the same information that's contained within the staff report. Um, and um, so I, I don't have any concerns about the language that they're proposing and using in terms of whether it's factual or not or opinionated in any way. It's it's just, it it's very bland in terms of what it is, but there may be questions um, that come up. So there are a few ways that we can go about this. One um, would be to have the Charter Review Commission do that and that we ask that they stay purely factual and that they direct any questions to the county council, to myself, to the website, um, and we'd be happy to answer those questions. Um, another idea would possibly be putting together some sort of, um, whether it's like a one pager or even like a short video or something that is an explanation of what these are, that then the Charter Review Commission could just play that or show that and say, here's the information. If you have questions, here's the follow up. Um, that way we control completely what's what's in that, um, although it has to be factual and not encouraging a vote one way or the other. Um, the last would be, of course, sending out a county staff member with the Charter Review Commission members um, to present, again, just the factual information about that. So I wanted to see from you if um, you were comfortable with the Charter Review Commission just putting up the slides or if you would prefer to go a different direction. I really like the second option that you gave where we would create some 
uh, material for uh, them to hand out and make available. And it's it's very nice that they would uh, do that and include it in the total. I think it would be better that way than presented as a discussion item from them, uh, just because it comes directly from the council. Other thoughts? I, you know, since I'm un, unmuted at the moment, um, I would say I agree either that one or having just a staff member attend the meeting to answer any potential questions, I, I think would be okay too. Um, but either way, I, I think we should have them ha have the slides on there so that, it's all, that the charter issues are all in one conversation with the community. I think that's important, but I'd be okay with a, a sheet or a staff person. I'm uh, I'm fine with them including in, in their in their slide deck as long as it's been reviewed and, and seen that it's okay. Uh, I'm also fine with some kind of a handout. I don't know that I necessarily think it's a great use of staff time to remember along to the meetings to, to answer those questions. Um, I think we can probably it's not while it's it's complicated. It's not a terribly complex concept. So uh, while the details are are kind of complicated. The the pieces themselves aren't, and that probably a, a with with information would be able to do it. And folks could contact us with more questions. So I don't know if it was on my end, but I did have a lot of trouble hearing Councillor Lentz. A, a lot of the words were broken up um, and garbled. So I, what I heard was. Um, not such a good idea to have staff go along or use staff time and um actually i i hadn't really thought about this issue at all and i'm concerned about using one the staff and and orally answering questions you know then you're not controlling the narrative as to just facts only uh, versus opinion or explanation and then that comes from the county and it could open us up for taking a position one way or the other. Uh, I would rather just see things uh, in writing uh, that can be fact checked, if you will, for only factual presentation. Um, okay, so I mean, so it sounds like, so uh, Lindsay, I think number two was like do a, a factual sheet and have that along and then they have follow up questions, a place where they can contact us or anybody at the county to answer those follow up questions. Is that option two? Sure. So what I will do, I'll put together the the draft to get it to Johnny and Lee for them to to polish, and um, then we'll send it for you for your review. Um, and if we need to have a council time discussion, we will. But if everybody says it looks good, then I'll get it off to the Charter Review Commission folks. Okay, that sounds great. And you had another item as well. I do. C Pacer. So, um, what is going on with this one? Um, a couple of counties have now um, moved closer to adoption. Whatcom County did pass one on July 13th, um, and Thurston County is um, set, I believe, to approve a different version um, here shortly if they have not already. And so, we're really at a crossroads here where we need uh, council input on the the liability, the approach to what happens in the event of a foreclosure on this process. So, um, of course, there there there's a loan from the lender for the C Pacer loan for the work uh, that falls within the program. And then the question is really who is responsible for what in the event of a default. Um, and there's kind of two approaches that seem to be materializing um, within the counties and just a little bit of background too. So. Um, when the state legislature adopted this, they included um, funds within the, the budget to have commerce pull together a stakeholder group and try and create model language. Um, that was at the beginning of the pandemic. The governor did a pretty mass veto of a number of budget provisos, not, sh not uh, knowing what impact the pandemic would have on state revenues. This was one of the items that was vetoed and it hasn't gotten back within the state budget for funding. And so 
we didn't have the legislature really try and address these nuance issues because they were under the impression commerce was going to do it and then commerce never did it because they didn't have the funds from the state budget to do so so um there is a recommendation from uh, at least one of the stakeholders one of the lenders to treat these as any sort of um basically tax delinquency so in fact their specific language was um to she said, regardless of the state or CPACE program, it's imperative to the security of CPACE that the delinquent unpaid assessment amounts are enforced by the local government in the same manner as other delinquent assessments. Um, and without this assurance, their position is that lenders would not be able to fund projects. Whatcom County took a different approach. Um, they are treating it as any sort of um, loan delinquency in the same way that if you or I didn't pay our bank for our mortgage that our financial institution would then come and, and do that process. Their specific language, I'm pulling it up here, um, is that there's no liability, there's no public funds um, and that any collection enforcement of delinquent liens or financing payment shall remain the responsibility of the capital provider and that the county shall have no obligation to prosecute foreclosure of the CPACE or lien on behalf of the capital provider um, and that any duties that the county um, has deemed non-delegable because of course if there is a foreclosure there are parts that the county has to do that the county would do um, and be performed on a reimbursable basis by the county on behalf of the capital provider. And so any funds that would be required for those non-delegable portions would be paid for um, by the capital provider. And that's the ordinance that Whatcom County has adopted. So at this point, there's really no way to treat them as a, a, loan, um, a loan delinquency in which the county only does the, the non-delegable portions would really take on no liability or the alternative is to treat it as a tax delinquency and we take on additional liability there. Just for additional information um, from what I can gather from the lenders is, is that foreclosures don't happen very often um, in the history of the program. While there's been you know, millions of dollars that have been put in for these loans, um, at least the one lender that we're in contact with um, has had two foreclosures that they're aware of nationwide. One of them in, did not end up going through the foreclosure process because somebody purchased the property and assumed the debt. Um, so it doesn't happen often. That being said, um, I think our, our treasurer made the point that if it doesn't happen often and it really doesn't matter, then it shouldn't be a deal breaker for the lenders as part of the language. And that was her position there. So we're at this point where we can go with a Whatcom County style language um, and then see if lenders are able to come. It's the most protective of the county. Um, and then go back to the legislature and say, we need some additional tweaks in order to be able to make this fully functional and the legislature needs to address these issues um, if, if lenders don't come. So that's one option. The other option is to adopt the language that Thurston County is looking at um, and that's being recommended by the stakeholders so that we can have a more assurance that the program will get off the ground and running, knowing that that's going to take on additional um, liability exposure for the county. So I wanted to get the council's feedback and see if you have a proposed language um, and then we can get this on for hearing if the council wants to move forward. So, I'm, happy. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilor go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Taylor, if you had input. Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, comment that I had our office had intended to be ready for a, a, a more in depth discussion of, of this topic today. Um, but due to a, a number of uh, competing priorities, we simply weren't able to get ready for today. And I'd ask that we talk about it uh, next week uh, at next week's council time. Generally, I agree with uh, uh, Lindsay's kind of summary of the two options that are kind of out there right now, the Whatcom option and the Thurston option, not to the exclusion of any, you know, other option we might want to come up with, but um, I expect that we'll be able to have a little more to say about that on Wednesday. So, I, I just want to give my initial thoughts. So, I'm in favor of moving forward as, as I think we all were originally. And then none of these issues 
uh, I believe, were ever an issue before the legislature. I, you know, my initial inquiries showed by pull up bipartisan support and really no issue with any of the potential liability that the counties uh, would be taking on. So these issues, I, I think, just weren't delved into, and certainly we didn't get the model language. But I would, I, I already know that we have one interested party for the port of Kamswashugal. Um, I find it hard to believe that the lenders aren't able to step up if we take the Whatcom uh, approach, which is what I favor. You know, it's a risk of doing business. And as Lindsay pointed out, if it's such a minor occurrence, then it's a low risk for them. I, I don't think we should take on any additional liability and somewhat provide uh, a safety net uh, for lenders, the capital lenders out there. I don't think that was the intent of the legislature. Uh, but I, I don't want to step in, in the role of being a legislator uh, at the local level uh, to offer that kind of protection, uh, even though it, it may be a de minimis uh, risk. I, I would go and like to explore more fully the, the Whatcom kind of language and, and put it in place and then see if there are any lenders out there that are interested. If not, I'm sure they're going to lobby the legislature for some changes to make it more uh, of a palatable financial model for them. Uh, but those are my thoughts at this time. I uh, actually concur with that. And the reason being in large part to minimize the uh, liability to the county seems prudent, even though it is a small chance of there being a, a, a claim in that liability. But still, for the minuscule amount that that exists, let's keep that liability low as low as we can. I feel similarly, and I uh, to add in uh, the reasons that we do our best to county. And it's unfortunate that we have this problem, uh, but I don't, I don't want to. Make a decision that goes against the, uh, the good our treasurer. And I think that that's, um, she's, she's giving us opinion and advice and I think it's sound. Um, and perhaps if it turns out that this is not. Workable lenders don't find it workable, then perhaps we, along with Whatcom and other people who are interested, can take this to the legislature to get some fixes. Okay, sounds like we have a path. I concur for all the reasons stated. So, um, Lindsay, do you have what you need? I do. Um, is there a council desire to bring this back to council time, or are you ready to take the Whatcom County language and get prepare it for public hearing? Oh, it's, I don't know. I, I, Taylor, do you have any concerns? I mean, we've got four people that kind of agree on a path forward. <clears throat> no, Councilor, generally I, I don't. I know that um, I had a conversation with the treasurer uh, recently and, and because it wasn't a specific item on the agenda today that I, I understand she might not have attended um, to, so th that might be the only thing I would add. Is that there may be some additional input from from the treasurer, but maybe you already have that. So could we just, uh, if we're going to talk about draft language, um, is that something we could bring back to council time to review for the purposes of feedback from anybody else? So I what I could do idea. is um, we can kind of tentatively plan on putting it for the August seventeenth hearing, and then schedule a council time next week, um, which would give the council plenty of time to pull it. But we'll kind of tentatively pencil it in for the seventeenth. Okay, Taylor, does that work? I think it should. Okay. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad we have a path forward on this. That's it for me. Okay, then it looks like we are going to move into executive session for pending litigation uh, according to RCW 42.30.1101I for 20 minutes and I, no action. That's correct. Okay, um, and we will have an attorney present, I assume. Yes. Okay, all right, well then we'll adjourn and move into executive session. Thanks everyone. <laughs>